of all these stories, I think, um, build us as, as, uh, as uh, you know, disciples of people who come before us. But Dr. Rudder uh, is, is, without any question, uh, uh, and like I said, an excellent mentor, an excellent surgeon. And I think that uh, his talks are some of the more entertaining talks uh, I've seen. And if you've seen them in the past, you know this. So thanks a lot for spending a couple days uh, out of your time to come at least give us this afternoon. And uh, I appreciate the invitation to come. And as you know, Doug is not only an extremely gifted surgeon, but he's very entertaining to have around. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just going to do a quick run through a few different things in terms of, you know, I've been doing this for about 18 years. And even in that time, it's remarkable how much things have changed. And so the mandatory disclosure slide, um, the simple answer is I've worked with a hell of a lot of people. There's a stint out there with my name on it that I don't get royalties for. I worked with a Clarence and helped design a balloon dilator with Peter Coltai. I then left a Clarent and um, uh, because they weren't interested in a balloon I patented, so I'm now doing that separately. Um, but no one's paying me anything at the moment, sadly. I do hope that that will be corrected <laughs> soon. And um, I use a lot of products off label. And so let's move on. And so the basic history lesson is that up till the 70s, generally speaking, airway surgery meant endoscopic surgery. And then basically the guy who kind of ruined that concept was a chap called Robin Cotton, who was one of my mentors and partners. And really over the next three decades, if you couldn't do a big open airway operation, you really were considered a second class citizen in terms of airway surgery. And now we're really seeing the wheel turning again, where open and endoscopic surgery is sort of seen as complementary. And the timeline here, um, again, we started off with mainly bougenage techniques, and then that gave way to lowering the tracheoplasty. This is really ready and hungry with the four quadrants, split with very long stenting. Uh, then Robin brought in cartilage grafting. John Evans in London did a castellated tracheal incision hasn't stood the test of time, though it seemed a very clever idea. Uh, Philippe Monnier and Robin started doing pediatric trichotracheal resection. You then saw the introduction of spinal tracheoplasty. And through all of this, you've slowly seen a resurgence of interest in endoscopic surgery. And the context, one year snapshot, um, and this is my personal figures for 2000 because I've been too lazy to update them. Um, I did some LTPs, I did some slides, some CTRs, some clefts, just as your vague feel of what I do. But I also do a lot of endoscopic airway surgery. I've done a lot of balloon dilations, <coughs> endoscopic cleft repairs, tracheoesophageal fistula repairs, uh, webs and grafts. That's probably all a little bit out of date, but it gives you an idea of sort of some of the stuff that we do. And so there's a couple of concept slides here. This is the first of them. And really, if there's anything you want to take away from this, it's the two concept slides. And so this is the concept of the laryngotracheal skeleton. And basically, if the exoskeleton of your airway is intact, you're dealing with an intraluminal problem, a scar tissue. You've got a decent chance that an endoscopic operation is going to work. It's certainly worth a shot. If you have a framework problem, if your exoskeleton has an absence of cartilage, or it's um, fundamentally too small, say to filtrate your rings, um, you've got an A-frame deformity. Um, if you are have had cartilage destroyed by an infection. So if you've got a framework problem, endoscopic surgery is probably not going to work unless you're altering that framework. And generally that's where we do an open airway operation. And so the pathology matters in that sense. If you've got complete tracheal rings, you need an open airway operation. You don't really need to engage much higher thought. 
So the pathology methods. Uh, with a lot of disorders, it can be one or the other, or this nuance of God. And then, of course, there's the influence of the surgeon. It's what you feel comfortable being able to do. And then, and really, this is the key with airway surgery, it's risk mitigation. It's trying to work out what could go wrong and how you can prevent it going wrong, or what you can do about it if it does go wrong. Because in airway surgery, things go wrong now and then. And so some of the dilemmas are go open or endoscopic with <coughs> cysts, webs, vocal cord paralysis, stenosis, clamps, fistulas, pouches. And I'm just going to touch on a few of these and we'll go fairly fast through it. And so lingual thyroglossal duct cysts. 20 years ago, this was a relatively rare diagnosis. It's actually become far more common and it's not that the disorder is more common. It's the Everyone with a headache gets an MRI scan. And so you're tending to see these pop up, so to speak. And um, often as an incidental finding in an old child. In a neonate, this can be actually really quite exciting and a little disconcerting. Those can be frightening babies. And they always look the same. And you know, I've got a series of photos here. These are all of different kids. And all of these look very characteristic, thick walled just above the lingua. And we found that this is a case where an endoscopic excision works extremely well. You use a bobe through a medium lint hole, the six inch long guarded tip needle point bobe fits perfectly down a medium lint hole, and you just carve it out. Now, for the attendings, the things that you need to know here is that if you don't tell your resident that it's almost impossible to take this out without popping the cyst. You tell them that they get extra bonus points if they can get it out intact. You also don't tell them that it's much easier once it's burst to get it out. And so this is all tactical. These are important things to know. And so um, an endoscopic excision really does work quite well. Yet the saccular cyst, the Loringa seal, and so the one on the right is quiet because papillomas blocked, blocked the ventricle, the one on the left is congenital. And it's awfully tempting to tackle this endoscopically. And typically, if you tackle this endoscopically, you're going to go through several attempts and probably a tracheotomy at some point. And so here's a baby who doesn't have a trachea. They do not have a very good airway. Again, this kid does not have a trachea. And the next few slides are all of the same kit. This is a case where actually an open airway operation is extremely rapid and very effective. You find the thyroid cartilage, you go to the top of the thyrohyoid membrane or, or just above the thyroid cartilage, and you actually can peel out the cyst intact. Mm. And this is the same child two hours later. And it's curative. And so this is one of those times where actually what looks to be something you would tackle endoscopically can be very quickly and easily tackled open with a very nice result. So what about laryngeal webs? We're sort of starting at the top, working down and away. And so the key <coughs> here, do you go endoscopic, do you go open? And I think the key thing here is are the vocal cords scarred? If you've got a congenital web, the mucosa is extremely mobile, and you actually get a better result going open. If you've got scarring, you can't mobilize the mucosa. You accept that you're going to get a suboptimal mucosal wave, and you may as well go endoscopically. And so for the open repairs, and the other advantage of an open repair is a lot of these kids have a bit of a subglottic stenosis, which you can fix at the same time. You do a complete moringa fissure through the web. The gossamer thin webs are incredibly rare, and those are different. Anything you do to them works. You stick an ET tube through there and rupture it, it works. But 
Most of them are a partial laryngeal atresia. About 60% of them are velocardiofacial syndrome, or the jaw and jaw, whatever you want to call it. Um, but with these kids, if you divide the web, and this is really the key here, you can fix up the cut edge of the mucosa right up to the thyroid alar on both sides and recreate a mucosalized cord all the way up to the thyroid cartilage. So this is a pre-op, post-op of the same girl. She's mm. three months old. She's also got a chromosome 22 anomaly. This one is actually cat eye syndrome. And you know, you can see on the left, that's not a great airway. She doesn't have a break. She's doing OK. The kids in the small airway do surprisingly well. But we were able to stretch the cut edge of that mucosa all the way up to the thyroid cut. Now, meanwhile, if you've got scarred cords, so this is a girl who had papilloma, 60 lasers later, she no longer has papilloma, she's quiescent, she's got a few lung lesions, but she's basically lung, and she's got a really bad voice. And so what we did was that we endoscopically divided the scar tissue with a sickle knife, And this is putting an endoscopic laryngeal keel. There are several different ways of doing that. And this is the way that we use, but you know, there's more than one way to skin that cap. And so we steal the thinnest bit of silastic sheet off the otology tray that we can find. It's always good when you can find something useful on an otology tray. <laughs> and um, <laughs> this is sort of getting it in position with the two stitches through it. And Again, trying to get that keel positioned well. So you've got it basically like, like a bookend. You've got, you've got the spine of the book. And to get this in the right position takes a lot of lubricant. And the only adequate lubrication I found is a completely of the other square words. <laughs> and once you get that thing in place, this is the same girl on the right now. We sent her home the next day. She came back two weeks later. And this is her about six weeks later. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. The thing that is impressive, though, is that, yeah, her voice improved. Her airway improved. She didn't know she had an airway problem, and neither did we. But she came back and said, I can do so much more. It was really quite interesting. What about bilateral vocal cord paralysis in babies? So probably the gold standard is if you're symptomatic, trach them, wait it out for a year or two, and if they get better, take the trach out, and if they don't, then you do something. What do you do? You've got half a dozen options. You could put in a posterior graft, endoscopic or open. You could do a vocal cord lateralization, endoscopic or open. You could do an aretinoidectomy, endoscopic or open. And you could do a laser cordotomy, hopefully just endoscopically. Um, so there's many options. And whenever you've got half a dozen options, it's telling you that none of them works perfectly. And so my preference has always been to put in a posterior costal cartilage graft. And if that fails, then I do a cord lateralization. One of my colleagues, Robin Cotton, is exactly the other way around. It's quite interesting. We agree on most things, and that's the one thing we've always never quite seen eye to eye on. And so the other parallel observation is that if you are a baby with acquired subglottic stenosis, an anterior thyroid alar graft with a posterior slip works incredibly well because the posterior slip, you don't need to graft within a week or two. And so it just gives you that bit extra you need. And so this is a typical uh, subglottic stenosis, RSV, intubated, developed a stenosis, anterior thyroid alar graft, posterior slip. And so and this is the same child um, a few months later. You can see the end of the thyroid alar graft. 
And so you then take the next logical step, um, endoscopic posteriograms. And so this is Andy Inglis's idea. And Andy's in Seattle. He's a really smart dude. And um, he Very funny, too. Oh, he's hilarious. And so... Um, Buy the cookie for, okay? Sure, I'll sound on that one. Um, so, and, and the take home message this is the same girl, and at the top, doesn't look too bad. At the bottom, awake and asleep, it looks totally different. So, she's got a vocal cord paralysis, but if you're anesthetized in the operating room, you might not appreciate it. But it looks pretty good. At the bottom, it doesn't look so good. And so, this is putting in vocal cord spreaders, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to wait as I meander through doing a posterior spreading for this bra. But um, this is an endoscopic posterior bra. And so I had this great idea. Why don't we just do an endoscopic posterior split and intubate the kid through? Because we know it fills in in kids who had an anterior thyroid ali graft and a posterior split. And we know that one of the treatments of choice is to put in a posterior graft if they were saying two. So why don't we try that? And that didn't work. And so I actually spent two years waiting for a kid to come along and try it on. And I didn't get a kid, just these things ebb and flow. But one of my colleagues did, Sandra the Alicons, so I convinced them to do this and it just Break the kid. So he wasn't happy with me. Um, and this is why I think it went wrong. I think that the cricoid bulldog jumps. And so if you open the back of the cricoid, it's like a bulldog club. It wants to spring close. So you need to kill the spring in the bulldog club. So when we do a thyroid A graft, we've got to cut through the anterior cricoid. So we kill the spring of the cricoid. And so that evolved to, should we do an endoscopic anterior posterior split? And so we started doing that, and typically split the back, split the front, balloon dilated it to make sure it was popped open, left them intubated for about 10, 12 days. Doug's actually writing this up at the moment. And we did rather better. Not perfect but not bad. And so again, this is just showing you some of the uh, technique during the endoscopic <coughs> split. And um, it's actually a reasonably slick and quick and easy operation. It's surprisingly not that difficult. And so the results. Now, I am not enormously statistically gifted, but eight kids that would have been trait weren't trait. And I believe that that's significant. But, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be people who correct me on that. I'm damn glad that Rich Rosenfeld isn't in the room. So, however, it wasn't perfect. A lot of them needed other things done. And the longer you intubated, the better they did. But increasingly, leaving kids intubated for very long periods is fairly unfashionable. And so we tried an evolution of this. So this is what we're playing with at the moment. So this is doing an anterior split. But posteriorly, we're doing a submucosal endoscopic <coughs> posterior cricoid split. So you raise a little flap over the anterior cricoid, you split the cartilage with the little stiff straight ahead endo scissors, and you put a spacer in the gap. And uh, we're using a little bit of bioabsorbable mini plate. Now that sounds incredibly difficult. And really it's not. This is actually being done by one of my fellows, Niall Jensen, who's Australian. So trust me, this cannot be that difficult. <laughs> and you know, I come from New Zealand, so th this oh. you know, th this involves a lot of trust. And um, uh, 
this was a kid with bilateral vocal cord paralysis. Extremely symptomatic to the point they got intubated on the neonatal unit. We watched them for a few days. And um, we extubated the next day and they transiently aspirated for two days on swallow study, got better, their voice was okay. Uh, six months later, their vocal cords recovered, so the kid's totally fine now. But he actually did incredibly well and was intubated for one night. And so I'm not sure if that's going to be something we'll be pursuing long term, but it's certainly intriguing. Now, you guys know a lot about balloon dilation, and so I'll go through some of this relatively fast. And um, I had one particularly glorious complication, which I will share with you, because again, you learn more from your complications than pretty much anything else. And so balloon dilation, at the moment, the results are all over the map, because people are lumping together their limited experience of And we're really lacking guidelines at the moment. We're pretty much stuck in expert opinion mode, frankly. And so these are the things we don't know. We don't know what size balloon to use. We don't know how much pressure to put in that balloon. We don't know how long to keep it inflated. We don't know when to repeat it. We don't know how often to repeat it. We don't know who shouldn't be dilated. Kids with hip trachea rings should. Um, and we don't know when additional procedures should be done. And so this is the very first kid I ever dilated, February 2001. It was also our very first slide. And uh, this girl developed a figure eight trachea, and I did not know what that was at the time. She had a slight subloid stenosis of the liver, as you see. So I went to the autopsy suite, and I tried to explode a couple of tracheas with balloons, and I didn't succeed. I thought, what the hell, and I tried it on her. Now, I now know that figure eight tracheas usually just get better on their own, but that was the seed that sort of made me interested in moving forward. And so these are now sort of the guidelines we've developed. It's not exactly the same guidelines that you're using at Stanford, and I think that's, again, a you know, good evidence that there's more than one way to skin the cat, and we still don't know. Um, a lot of these things will be answered by animal studies in the future, but it's not quite there yet. And so I take the outer diameter of an age-appropriate endotracheal tube, and I add a millimeter for the larynx and two millimeters for the trachea. And so a four-year-old takes a 5 the OD on a 5 is 6.8 millimeters, call it 7 millimeters. So I'd use an 8 millimeter balloon for the larynx and a 9 millimeter balloon for the trachea. And the guideline is not a mandate, it's just gives you a rule of thumb of how to look at things. And um, the usually we place it under direct vision. We pre-oxygenated the kid. We give them a burst of propofol, diprofan, Jackson juice. Mm. Um, mm. And <laughs> then inflate the balloon to its rate of burst pressure, whatever that may be. And I leave it there for two minutes. The reason I leave it there for two minutes is that if you inflate a balloon on a bench, the pressure doesn't drop. If you put it into a patient, the pressure keeps dropping and you keep adding fluid. And that's because the scar tissue is giving. And it does that for about 90 seconds. So I just leave it up for about two minutes, because most people can take it. If the sat's hit 90, I take it out early. And, um, and I just do a single dilation each time. And we'll frequently dilate on three or four occasions. Um, sometimes we'll use catalog injections, and we'll talk about that a bit more shortly. If you've done five dilations and you're not winning, you're probably not winning. There may be good reasons to keep dilating because the alternatives may be worse, but you at least need to start entertaining the idea that there might be a better solution. And so increasingly, I'm now dividing scar tissue and injecting steroid. And the, um, I usually use a Mercedes star incision, but primarily you just go where the scar bands are. Uh, you can use a laser for this. I use a sickle knife. I 
uh, actually notice that the incidence of having a laser fire is dramatically lower if you don't use a laser. And um, <laughs> thin webs, you can just balloon them. But if you've got thick, complex ones like this, this is where it may be worth injecting some steroid, dividing the scar tissue, and then going in. So this is one of our older sickle knives, the reusable ones, which are magnificently blunt. This is really a form of therapeutic <coughs> massage. <laughs> and um, what we tend to use now are blitz of lay, um, the disposable blitz of lay. And I'll show you a picture of that shortly. And the orotracheal injector set, because these are disposable and they're super uh, sharp and um, they're very nice to use. So this girl, we got her from a 3.5 to a 4.5, from a symptomatic airway to an asymptomatic airway that didn't need an open airway to construct. And so that's a blitz of lay. Um, I'm not sure if you use them here, but the blade's disposable, the handle's reusable, the blade is always new and sharp. It's a very nice tool. And that's the orotracheal injector set. Again, most of it's reusable, bar the 30 gauge needle, which is disposable and always sharp. Nice tools. And so, similar story, six year old girl, and this is. Uh, before and after we divide, divided scar tissue and balloon and dilated her, and a lot of injection. And this is her two weeks later at the top and a year later at the bottom. Again, we got it from a symptomatic airway that looked like it would need an open airway procedure to an asymptomatic airway that is now five years out. And if you can do it in the larynx, you can do it in the trachea. This is a boy who uh, was sent to us with that for a slide on bypass in the tracheal tube injury. And instead, we divided the scar tissue, dilated it one single time. This is 18 months later. It's not normal, but it's the same size as his frontal. So it's an age appropriate airway and saved him a slide on bypass for what was effectively a 10 minute procedure. And so you've always got to put in your best case. So this is a boy who was a grade 3, had a bougie dilation, and it's turned into a grade 4 on the center. And this was a pretty fresh one. So this had all happened in the preceding month. And so it's a grade four, but you know it's in the young and fresh category. And so I took an alligator forcep and just poked it through. You've got to have a certain degree of moral fortitude to do that. You're rather hoping you end up in the trachea on the other side. Of it. And this is just a great video because as the balloon dilates, you can look through the walls of the balloon and actually see the stenosis stretching out. If you listen very, very carefully, you can actually hear the fiberglass screams. <laughs> <laughs> and this is immediately afterwards. You basically now got an open airway. Now, it's going to scar. You know it's going to scar. It's great for. So this is where we put in an endoscopic suprastomal stent. And uh, the stent was in for a few weeks, took it out, one dilation. This is him eight weeks later, and this is him a year later. Age-appropriate airway decannulated from a grade four with a balloon dilation. Now the problems with balloons are several. They're very simple. <coughs> So they watermelon the seed. And the problem is if they watermelon the seed away from you, you want to stop that. And so you tend to try and pull on them. But if you pull on them and stretch the cannula, you then can't deflate the balloon. Inflated balloon beyond the stenosis. It's always distinctly relaxing. And so
So that's where you've got to have a long needle or knife that you put through the cords or through the neck to pop it quickly. And so um, and balloons have the potential to rupture the airway. You've got the potential for negative pressure pulmonary edema, though that only seems to happen in adults. And there is at least one report from Florida of a boy who got connected to a jet ventilator through the balloon, with the balloon inflated by an anesthetist. He clearly was a moron and exploded the kid. Pneumonia, pneumothorax, pneumopericardium, pneumothorax. Kids survived, but really had a bit of a traumatic experience. And so this is my complication. So this is a boy who had a slide on bypass, whole trachea pretty much. You can see most of the slide looks great. Bottom bit doesn't. And he reads the notes. I've only had one kid do this. I don't know how he did it. I didn't appreciate it. It was not thoughtful. So he done it like him two or three times. And on the third attempt, the balloon watermelon seeded into his right bronchus, which was a bit stenotic. And that is his right bronchus. Mm. And that is a hole side of his right bronchus. Mm -hmm. And that is his pericardium. Yeah. And that's the bronchus. And yes, that's the pericardium. Mm -hmm. And as Doug was alluding to, I currently have the largest world series of having seen the heart inside the bronchus. Mm -hmm. And I have not felt a strong need to publish this. <laughs> um, however, I have learned a couple of things. If this is a virgin chest, go badly extremely fast. Air goes places it shouldn't go. You've got an emergent intervention on the horizon. Um, if, however, if it's not a virgin chest, everything's walled off and it's comparatively benign. And so this boy, I didn't <coughs> it because I didn't want positive pressure. I wanted the negative pressure ventilating, breathing on his own. We put him back on ICU. I told the nurses to keep him happy. I didn't want him to cry for a week. And a week later, it had completely healed. And it actually fixed his right bronchial stenosis. <laughs> it's not a way I would advocate of fixing bronchial stenosis. I mean, we dodged a bullet. He got away with it. I got away with it. But it was a bad complication. And that experience made me try and think about, you know, we're problem solvers. That was a problem. So I tried to think of how you could have a non-slip balloon. In my mind, if it's a surface coating, it's just going to be a sandpaper. It's going to move, and it's going to destroy the opposer. So I thought if either end of the balloon goes up first and grips the stenosis before the center goes up, that might do it. And so this was the balloon that I spent many, many years trying to sell to a cloud. And they weren't interested. They wanted to Thank you. And it's very interesting how they've completely changed their tune at this point in time. But the either end goes up before the center goes up, so it grips the stenosis. Now, any balloon can slip, but that style is less likely to. And so this is the first kid we used it on. And again, you know, I've got skin in the game with this. This is part of my um, disclosure. So far, I have earned absolutely nothing, and I've spent a hell of a lot on lawyers. But I really hope they will change one day. <laughs> and um, I wanted to call it Balloon Assisted Dilation Airway Safety <laughs> Strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy I'm working with would not do that. And, you know, I was really a bit bent out of shape about that. But you, know, you kind of have to move on. And so, Open airway surgery, there's really three operations. You can augment it, you can resect it, or you can slide it. Open airway surgery, the laryngotracheal stenosis. And again, this is another concept slide. There are only three options. Augment, resect, slide. And augmentation grafting, um, So this is pre and post a posterior graft. And whether this is an anterior graft, a posterior graft, an AP graft, a pericardial patch, all of these are augmentation grafts. And the 
thing that's interesting about them is that um, it's a two-dimensional operation. So the dirty little secret is that you know, in Cincinnati, we've done a hell of a lot of this with 40 fellows over 30 years or more. And the surgeon doesn't matter that much. Most operations, the surgeon doesn't matter. I take your tonsils out, he takes your tonsils out, in 10 years' time, doesn't really matter. Appendicectomy, the same. Some operations, the surgeon matters. A misinfundoplication, an aorta case, the surgeon matters. But for this, frankly, the predictors of success are the greater the stenosis, whether it's an active larynx, whether it's a revision surgery, whether it's multi-level. The surgeon matters, but it's down the list. And so resection surgery, and the concept of this is a right tracheal section, cut out the bad, but join the ends together. And again, we've stopped doing tracheal sections. We now do many slides. Um, but the concept of the resection is extremely good. And the tracheal resection is fairly two dimensional, not that surgeon specific. But a cricotracheal tracheal resection is distinctly three dimensional surgeon specific with a learning curve and so try and do some good candidates the idiopathic females are ideal to learn how to do this because when it goes wrong it can really go wrong and so usually you'll get an excellent outcome by the cases you've done and then the slide tracheoplasty is the third operation and Again, we talked about it earlier on with the residents. So this is where you're sliding the trachea across itself, cut it in two, split the head end at the front, split the foot end at the back, slide it across itself. Half the length, twice the diameter. And the versatile operation, um, it's interesting that this operation, and I won't play the cartoon, is actually surgeon specific as well. And we didn't realize that when we started. We had done so many cases on cardiac bypass and trachea rings. When we started doing these and we were getting good results, we thought it was fully translatable. And um, what's been interesting is that the world has now realized that this is actually a very good operation compared to the alternatives. But we're now getting other people's failures coming through. And in fact, this is a learning curve surgeon-specific operation. I didn't realize this in Christ a long time. So it's still a very good operation, but not quite as good as we had hoped in the sense um, the surgeon does matter. So laryngeal collapse. Uh, this is the same child. Flexible bronchoscopy on the left, rigid bronchoscopy on the right. Take home message, flexible bronchs, totally suck for looking at the posterior glottis. They are not reliable to diagnose flex. They are not reliable to diagnose posterior glottis stenosis. This is a kid with a very suggestive history. The guy doing this bronch is Paul Bash, who's one of the most gifted flexible bronchoscopists I've ever seen. He was a savant when he was and he's looking for it, and he cannot find it. And this kid's got a type 1. And again, beware flexible bronchoscopy for diagnosing these. Now, hmm. the way I started to repair these is that you know, everyone at the time was writing about doing these fancy two-layer closures with APO PBS, and hmm. just not competent enough to do that. And you know, my patience is just not up to it. So here's someone who's had that attempted, and it didn't quite work. You can see there was a small dehiscence in the repair. And um, I did a much more mass closure approach. You want raw against raw. I just mass remove a strip of mucosa on either side, and then I put a relatively big suture 
and with the most apical suture ideally being through the cuneiform cartilage, because it doesn't tend to fall out of cartilage. And it's not subtle, but it's not that difficult. And so this is the same girl, whoops, let's try that again. Following that repair. So that's the mass closure technique. Easier, faster, and more reliable. Generally speaking, anything that falls into that category, I tend to be a convert to. And we have this cleft classification where the Andy Inglis Bruce Benjamin classification went up to type 4. But the type 4 longs, the ones to carina, are a totally different animal. And so these are some of the dilemmas you have. Do you go endoscopic? Do you go open? Do you trach them or not? Do you G2 them or not? Do you miss them or not? And generally speaking, we're finding most kids with an adequate cricoid, even a type 3, it's worth a shot endoscopically. A difficult operation doing a type 3 in a small baby. You can do it, it's not straightforward. Um, this is the open technique we use for the long reflex. Transtracheal, in the front of the trachea, lift flaps on the back of the cleft, sew up the esophagus, sew up the trachea. If there's a risk factor, put in an interposition graft. And that's another diagram of the same thing. It's great with artwork to make it look like you've got uneven flaps so the suture lines are not contiguous. In real life, that's a little bit more difficult. And this is the interesting thing. This is something called a kaplan meyer plot. I don't know what that means, but apparently some of these flaps break down late. We've had some kids who were a So these kids, it's worth realizing that there is a late failure. And so some of the variants, if you've got an inadequate posterior glottis, you need an open operation. And, um, and the type 4 long is a particularly challenging one. So here's a kid who's had a cleft prepared, they've got a trait, and they've got not only a recurrence, but they've got an inadequate posterior cricoid. That's not cannulatable. And you're trying to work out, is that a hole? It looks suspicious. And so the way of working it out is if you take an alligator forcep and shove it down the esophagus and open it, like this, There's a hole. Mm. And so this is after a posterior graft. Putting a posterior graft in a cleft when there isn't a posterior cricoid is actually a really rather difficult thing to do. You've got to get some really wide flanges sometimes to get onto the thyroid aorta. Surprisingly tricky operation. And the interposition grafts, you can use a lot of things. What I currently use is thermal periosteum because it's in the field. It's easy to harvest, but it's incredibly strong. It's like Kevlar, it's bulletproof, and you can lay it between the legs. It's got a very long cleft to carina, very challenging, and so at the moment we're doing a transection tracheal approach through the neck, transect the trachea with the lower border of the cricoid, peel the trachea out of the chest with an ET tube through the neck, through the trachea, into a bronchus. So you're beyond the apex of the cleft, sew up the esophagus, sew up the back of the trachea, slap them into the position graft and reconnect it. Sounds kind of easy, and it's really not. So I think for the sake of time, we'll just move through that. Tracheoesophageal fistulas. If you've got a long, skinny tract, that's ideal for an endoscopic approach. I was mentioning to the residents earlier on that um, we've got 20 pediatric surgeons in our hospital. Each of them does one or two TEFs a year. And because of the referral pattern, I'm doing five or ten a year. I do about half open, I do about half endoscopically. The long, skinny tracks, ideal for an endoscopic approach. 
if it's a short, fat connection or a big hole or a multi-fail, then I go over. And so the residents have already seen this video. This is a child who's got three open failed repairs for a type C PPM as a neonate, third time nearly died, and they asked me to have a look. He's got a really big hole right on Carina, full of suture. So what we tried to do was to pull out the suture material. You need to be mucosalized. You need raw against raw. And this is pulling out the suture material. And we're going to go through this fast. So right bronchus, left bronchus, middle bronchus, esophageal mucosa. We put in a bug beat and cook it. And so. And then put in a little bit of fiber and glue afterwards. And this is the same child six months later. And again, truly, this is the same child. It looks like they never had a problem. Some TDFs are a lot more difficult, and if you've got a big hole, um, we tend to use a slide tracheoplasty. And I'll give you just a few examples of these. And so we transect the trachea either side of the hole and use the trachea attached to the hole to repair the hole. That repairs the esophagus. And then we slide the trachea up over the hole and reconnect it. So this artwork is sort of trying to represent how we're doing that. And so some examples. Here's a girl with subglottic stenosis and a big PPM that's already had three failed repairs. And uh, on the bottom slide, that's after the slide tracheoplasty, which fixed the subglottic stenosis and the TPM. This is another one with a very big hole in the trachea from a cuff injury eroding through, and a post-op view, where you don't look for the repair, because it's eliminated. You just look at the anastomosis above the repair. Very good operation for a difficult PEM. Pouches of variation on TEFs. Again, the residents have seen some of these videos. If you have a high TEF, you're likely to end up with a pouch. If you've got a pouch, you'll probably have malacia. If you have malacia, you'll probably get a trait. If you've got a trait, it'll want to go into a pouch and you try and die. And so the solution I came up with was to marsupialize the pouch endoscopically. And again, this is stealing someone else's equipment. So this is the scores of blind biopsy forcep. It's got porphyry, it's got suction, it's a true cup. And that's it in the pouch. And you've got to actually crank the wattage up to 40 or 50 watts when you're doing this. And you just pick your way through the pouch. Winding things up, and this relates more to uh, uh, stenosis than anything else, but basically the question is not when you should go open, it's more when you should not go endoscopic. And the do no harm concept, um, for example, with balloon dilation, if you follow some basic guidelines, you're unlikely to hurt anyone, and you may well help them. 
fail, you could probably still go ahead and do an engineering operation. The concept of the laryngotracheal skeleton helps you choose who you should do. But generally speaking, yarn scar and thin scar are the best candidates. And so I'm going to wind it up with um, this is my house in New Zealand. And what I've noticed over the years is that it's very easy to forget to stop working. And for me, I actually decided 10 years ago there were three things that I needed to be able to walk away. So one, I needed junior colleagues that I could hand things off to securely so I could walk away. So we've got some really good upcoming <coughs> surgeons who are superb. So that's been achieved. Two, I needed a carrot. That's the carrot. Mm. That's a really good carrot. Mm -hmm. And three, I needed an independent income source, which is why I've been pouring money into patent lawyers for 10 years, hoping that something might eventually work. <laughs> so, those were the three keys, and because of that, I fully intend to retire in the next five to ten years. That's absolutely my intent. So, thank you. Bravo. <laughs>